I'm, I'm here with Vile Valo to talk about the upcoming debut solo record, Neon War, out January 13th through Spine Farm Records. It's an absolute pleasure and honor to have a legend like yourself on the channel. Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you for having me. It's, a, it's such a weird and wondrous time. You know, it's been quite a while since I've been out in the open with my melancholy rock and roll. So, uh, <laughs> it's, you know, it's been a, the last gig him played was uh, New Year's Eve 2017. So it's a good okay. five years. Yes, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and with the pandemic and all, you know, there's been so many weird changes all over the world and, and uh, we've gone through a lot of poop to get to where we are now. So, um, so I'm really happy that I got the album done. I'm really happy that people seem to be interested in seeing the whole thing live, the whole shebang. And, uh, you know, tickets are selling like hotcakes, as they say, over yonder. And, yeah, uh, and, uh, yeah it's, 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 it's quite an interesting time after all this solitude and all this sort of, we were all in this tunnel and not really seeing light at the end of it, you know, for, for quite a bit. And it's getting easier now, but it, it, it's, it's still there. It's still in our subconscious and we're still quite worried about it. You yeah, know, there's another. no dark shadow surrounding us, if you will. Yeah. You know, it's not completely. Yeah. And, yeah. and I want to think that those five years that you mentioned, because I think that's kind of interesting that it's been that long. Did did the pandemic play a role in that, or do you felt like you needed that kind of time to separate the past from the present and concentrating more on the future? Uh, I think it was both. I think that uh, him was such a big part of, uh, and is such a big part of who I am. I grew up with the guys and it, it was my life for more than half of my life. So I didn't know what to expect when the band was done. I, I didn't, I, I, I felt that it might be that I feel like losing a limb, you know, after the band is done, all of a sudden it feels like this big chunk of me has, has vanished. But uh, um, oddly enough, the, the only uh, new feeling I had on, on the uh, first day after the last gig was, was uh, a great sense of re relief. I was really happy that we were able to pull off the last tour in a way that there was no animosity. Uh, we still maintain our friendship, which is quite rare when it comes to rock bands. Usually it always falls apart in a sort of like not cool way. So uh, I think that that's probably one of the greatest achievements of the band Hen was to split in a sort of like a gentlemanly way. And, uh, and yeah, I wanted to take a little bit, a bit of a break afterwards, but I also did a project here in Finland. Uh, I sang in Finnish. We did these old like 60s, 70s tunes, like the stuff my mom and my, my dad used to listen to when they were younger. And we toured with that uh, project quite a bit for about, we recorded and toured until the end of summer 2019. And that was a great thing for me because it was kind of like Shadows type of guitar, 50s oriented, really sort of Twin Peaks sort of music. And it was cool for me because I didn't have to write the music. I was singing Finnish classics, whatever that might mean to you. But anyway, uh, uh, and it was complete 180 musically from him because I wasn't able to hide behind the sort of like the fuzzy guitars and, and the, the, the smoke machines and all that stuff. But uh, it, was, it was about singing and performing in front of very different kinds of audiences, very sensitive and sentimental and quiet music. So I think I acquired a lot a lot from that, uh, which I did put into Neon Noir uh, as well. So I think it was an, a lesson learned. Plus it gave me the, the time to, not only to work with music, but also to be away from the realm of him for a wee bit. And, and uh, later on in 2019, a few months before, uh, we started getting the visitors from Wuhan. Uh, the, uh, uh, I started working on new stuff. I hadn't really thought about it. I didn't know whether it's gonna be a band, whether it's gonna be a solo thing. I started demoing a few songs that became my first EP. Uh, the first one was Run Away From The Sun. The second was uh, Salute The Sanguine, and then Saturnine Saturnalia. And, and originally they started as demos, but then they turned out to be pretty good. I recorded that stuff by myself back home and, and and I wanted to ask Tim Palmer, a producer and, and a mixing engineer who would work on several him albums that, you know, what he'd think about them and if he'd consider that they're good enough for uh, public consumption, so to speak. And uh, he loved them and he, he mixed them. And, and then, then I decided to put that stuff out in, in springtime of uh, 2020, to sort of like gauge the interest, to see, test the waters if, if people are interested in, you know, the listeners, the old him geeks, and gals, you know, if they'd be interested in what I what I still have to say, and then also um, uh, the record companies, see if there's any interest there to put put the stuff out. And the EP came out on the same week as the lockdown started here in Finland, 
So it was around the same time, at least the whole of Europe. You had a you had a pretty different uh, scenario in in North America. Mm -hmm. It was uh, the rhythm. The lockdowns were very different from what we had here, but uh, um, way more extreme. So I really do feel for you, you know, for you know getting through all that that mess. But um, but get, so afterwards, I got the EP out. Uh, the only way I could think of surviving, you know, throughout all that, all that, um, the pandemic and all, all the broad, all the dark clouds and brought it on top of uh, everybody is, uh, was, was to write music and to work, keep on working on the music. And that, the demo sort of extended into the first EP that extended uh, and expanded uh, uh, and turned turn into Neon Noir. I, I kept on working for like two and a half years straight, more or less on the album. And the reason is that A, I'm a slow songwriter. I've always been. And B, uh, I recorded, performed and produced the whole thing by myself. And I'd never recorded an album before. I'd recorded demos, but uh, trying to get a proper drum sound or whatever, it was, uh, it was, it was quite a task, you know. God bless YouTube and, and all these sort of like the little trickery you can, you can uh, find oh, out. Do it yourself videos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was, uh, yeah, soldering. You know, I was, I was like soldering these old like seventies reverbs, trying to get them to work and all that stuff. It was, it was pretty wild. But, I, but at the same time, it was such a new experience and such a cool challenge um, to keep myself on my toes. You know, to not to, not to do the expected. I, I felt that, um, and I'm, I'm also I'm a huge fan of like Prince, and I grew up listening to a lot of Lenny Kravitz and Stevie Wonder and, and people who did a lot of stuff by themselves. And I thought that. Their albums have a very unique sound, I think, because it comes from a single point source. There's no record label. There's no uh, compromises uh, or conversations with the band. It's very on it. Yeah, and, very narrow. And, and, yeah, narrow, narrow and sort of like, the, it's like hyper-focused. And, and it can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing, but I, I wanted to experience that because it was something very new to me. And I thought that there's, um, that, um, yeah, I thought that it's a self-confidence booster if I'd be able to pull it off. And, and uh, that's, it, happened, it happened like that, one song at a time. And later on in 2021, uh, I had most of the album done uh, and I started feeling that, okay, now it sounds like an album. Let's try to figure out how to put it out and, and who'd be interested and, and all that. So I, I, I was kept busy. But uh, once again, I'm, I'm a bit of a sloth, you know, gothic sloth, you might call me. When it came to how you approach the construction of these songs from a creative standpoint, uh, how, how far did you want it to move away from the way you approached him songs? And did, was that thought process consciously or was more organic the way you approached the way uh, you took these tracks forward? Uh, it was very organic. I, I think that that's, uh, when I started after him, when I started first, like the first time I started speculating, what should I do in the future? And, you know, since it is a clean slate, I could do whatever and blah, 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 blah. I made the mistake of use, using the sort of like the rational and the intellectual side of the brain. And because the best thing to do is to pick up the guitar and see what happens. Because that's, that's when, it, when it's honest and it comes straight from the heart. And, and then you don't have to think about it. It's just... You, in good and in, in bad, you're given what you, you, you got what you got and that's it. You know, that's, that's what you have to work with. And uh, I, I found it really endearing that the music turned turn out having so many similarities with him. Because for me, it's sort of like, me that I've been right all, all along. It's like, a, it's just, it, it still keeps finding its own way. But the, the, the focal point, the sort of, um, the roots, are, are, are very close to there's, there's way more similarities between even the oldest hymn tracks and the neon noir stuff that there are than there are dissimilarities you know the sounds can be a bit different and and the way of uh, arrangement or mixing or, or, or production but but the essence of the melancholy sort of i don't know what to call it, the finished melancholy it, it's sad wistful nostalgic a little bit poetic at times and it's not uh, it's hopefully it's cathartic. That's what it is to me. It's not depressing. It doesn't, it hopefully, uh, like, like, you know, you know, when you're feeling not your, at, at your best, you know, when you're feeling depressed, you, at least I tend to listen to very dark music. And that brings me out of the funk for whatever reason. It's, it's quite weird. You would think the opposite, that yeah. you listen to happy music or whatever, but that's how, you know, that's what I learned from Black Sabbath. And uh, that sort of sense of 
melancholy and, and wistfulness is very important. You know, that's, sad music makes me happy and happy music makes me incredibly sad. I can't stand it. I think the melancholy is such a part, a huge part of Finnish culture and, and specifically Finnish music in general. When you look at bands like Amorphous, Swallow the Sun, bands that really capture that melancholy extremely well. I, I, I don't think a Finnish artist can create a record without somehow finding a place for it, but it's very warm. It's a very warm sounding melancholy, I would say. Oh, well, we are nicely put. I, I also find it, uh, it's very inviting. Yes, it's not very cold. welcoming. Yeah, 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 welcome is a good way to put it. Uh, that's how I feel too. It's, it's something that is very ingrained, I think, in what we do. It's even in the oldest of classical music, like classical composer Sibelius, who's very uh, worldwide, like considered one of one of the greatest. And uh, and the stuff he did was very meandering. He has a sense of it was ominous, but it wasn't. It, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't. So like it was, it wasn't Wagnerian. It wasn't pompous for the sake of being super big, but it was, uh, it was dark and ominous and heartbreakingly melancholy. And and also now we come to to semantics because the word melancholy means and melancholia means quite a few things uh, to different different people living in different uh, different parts of uh, the world. And uh, there's it's it's a funny word because it's traveled traveled um, long ways. So for, for, for Finns, it doesn't mean a negative thing. It doesn't mean something oppressing or depressing or uh, unconstructive. It means maybe more about the wistful nostalgia when you're bittersweetly looking back to something you once had. But I think the most important thing is the fact that you've actually had it once. It's an you experience had it. you've had. And it's not, not so much about uh, uh, losing the will to live or you know, like the, the sort of um, clinical description of depression is and that's 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 something that has been interesting to discuss with people for the past 30 years because it, in different culture cultures it really does mean different things and uh, you have to be quite sensitive uh, about it too because we're talking about things that can be pretty tough it's tough to explain verbally but also it's uh, it's a uh, it's tough stuff mentally to go through the issues that we tend to go through you know you're an artist that's done so many different things. Uh, I, I feel like whatever you set your mind to it, you can achieve because you have all the necessary tools. But when you look at Neon Noir, what creative itch does this record hold for you? Creative edge? Um, I'm biased because uh, as we discussed Prince and, and, and the sort of like narrow hyper focus where the, where the information is coming from, it's so very me that... Uh, love it or loathe it, I, I don't mind in essence because, um, because it is very pure. And I think that that is the edge because there wasn't any compromises. I, I was lacking in the camaraderie. I was lacking in the sense of brotherhood that we had with the band. But at the same time, I was able to work on the weirdest noises on the end of the songs. You know, I was able to do that for days. And uh, that's, some, that's a luxury I've never get, been given before. So I think in, in just in terms of um, music making and in terms of album making, I think that uh, honing in on details uh, was something I was able to do way more than before. Um, and I think that that I think the album has a very cinematic and atmospheric, quite ethereal at times as well. But it has that sort of like it's like well, well welcoming, uh, yeah, it's like melancholy with open arms, that sort of feel. And it's also it's paced in a way that I fe feel the album is quite peaceful. Even though it has up-tempo songs, it, it's not very uh, aggressive. It doesn't attack the listener. It's more asking people to join the experience than, than trying to rip everybody's head off. And I, that could be something that comes with age. I'm not quite sure, but that's, that's, I'm not sure whether to call that an edge, but that's, uh, that's the... Um, unique identity of this particular album and the feel that I don't think any of the hymn albums have. And also, I think it's something that's quite different from a lot of generic rock and hard rock and metal music these days. Um, you know, I, I feel kinship to bands like uh, Death Heaven, like they did uh, the Infinite Granite, their latest album. It, it's such a weird album, but I think that it's courageous to do things that are left of the center and things that that you, you feel that those guys just played it out from their hearts. They really went for it and they weren't really thinking about what, how people are gonna appreciate it. And I think it shows 
and it shows in in all the musicians' performances, and that's the stuff I appreciate. It doesn't have to be genre specific these days, but I I uh, I laud the sort of courageousness of musicians just to not to be afraid to look further than uh, than playlists. No? I, I see talking to you about this record that you feel like taking this solo approach, this solo avenue, uh, there's a lot of positives. You see a lot of positives in it. Uh, do, do you see any negatives? Because when you're that alone in the process, sometimes you may end up getting a little bit into the weeds and overthinking yourself. Is this right? Does this sound good? Like all of these things. So do you see any negatives at all in a process like this? I did all, all of the overthinking anyway with the band too. So <laughs> that, that has, hasn't changed one bit, but uh, one iota. But uh, the... Uh, but yeah, I miss the camaraderie and then I miss uh, brainstorming because I love um, just throwing out ideas and seeing what sticks, the sort of like Jackson Pollock technique, you know, just throw poop out and, and see what stays in there and what doesn't. And, and uh, that's the way I've worked for many, many a year. So this time around, I think the biggest challenge for me was to have the computer screen and the instruments be my only mates. So it was quite solitary, but then again, it was very undiluted because I didn't have to communicate. So I, I think, in, in other words, I think that it's great to have experienced both. Uh, time will tell whichever will make sh uh, more sense in the future. You know, if there's something, because I, I think I'm still too close to the album and there's still the tour to be done. And, 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 and usually through touring, you st sort of start to realize what resonates and why it resonates. Because that's the magic of music, you know, when you actually see physically how people react to songs, new and old. And uh, that's the next step of uh, seeing how the babies, you know, neo noir songs, how they how they travel the world. And uh, after that process, I'm probably way wiser regarding the good and the bad, the pros and the cons and, and what what road to take next, you know, what makes the most sense in, for, for the future. Speaking of the tour, you're going to be in Europe. You're going to be in the U.S. Sadly, no Canadian dates. So hopefully, yeah. at some point in time, uh, you, you decide to visit uh, the, this yeah. frozen country that has so many similarities. <laughs> England. Uh, yes, I have. I have some relatives uh, around somewhere in Thunder Bay. There was a lot of Finnish people moved over there. I think it's yes, huge Finnish stuff. community there. Used yeah. Be so uh, yeah, I never met them. They're so far, far, uh, far away and far apart from uh, from my family these days. But I remember seeing. I was. Uh, I was sent some pictures of the, ki the kids playing with uh, brown bears at a park somewhere. I still have those. Those are from the, I don't know, from 70s, or something like 60s or something. But uh, that's pretty cool. I always wanted to figure out if I could find some people in the family. But I haven't, I haven't been able to, to uh, make it happen yet. But, um, and sorry to interrupt you, but yes, we're working on uh, playing gigs, dates in, in Canada as well. And as well as, uh, as, well as Mexico and, and South America. And hopefully, hopefully Australia. And there's also uh, we're doing quite a few gigs in in the sort of central area in Europe. But we're not playing uh, Scandinavia. We're not doing uh, Sweden, Norway, Denmark yet with the band. So it's a, it's a big world, and we're working on all of that stuff, trying to make it happen because it, it would be great. I'm you know I'm, I have a good feel about the album, and uh, I think I need to show to myself that uh, even though I'm not a you know not the you know, I'm not, not the latest news. You know, I still have uh, what it takes. <laughs> I, I think you still have a lot of demand. And going back to, to what my question is going to be about the tour, yeah. are, are you going to just perform Neon War or are you going to include some of the hymn classics? It's going to be half and half. And I, I, I always hate it when bands play like the new album and then they play a few of the older tracks in the end. So I've decided that we're going to do zigzagging between. It's going to be a new song, an old song, a new song, an old song. It works perfectly together. Like Echolocate Your Love works great with Rip Out the Wings of the Butterfly, which works great with The Forever Lost, which works great with Right Here in My Arms, and so forth and so forth. I think that the sort of like the red line is so, you can hear it so well when you actually hear those songs in tandem and, and when they're right next to each other in the, in the set list. I find it really important because I also know that 99.9% uh, .9 are, are there to, uh, to see me you know, shake my bum and, and sing the uh, sing the uh, hymn tracks as well. It's not just about the new stuff. It, it's a sort of transitional moment, I guess, in my life. And it's a, you know, like a bridge between him and the future. And and uh, so I consider the past to be very important. I'm not disowning it at all. And and uh, quite the contrary, trying to uh, try to figure out cool new ways of uh, 
new angles to approach the hymn songs as well. They sound pretty good with the with the live band. We have two guitars, so we're able to do stuff we weren't able to do with him. So some of the stuff sounds even closer to to uh, the record recorded versions than than the live versions. So so yeah, I think it'll be it'll be ace. It's it's good stuff, and um, and, and the set feels really really strong as well because there's a there's a there's quite a few hymn songs that you know, rocked a few socks off back in the day. And uh, they still do keep on doing they that. Do. <laughs> well, well, hopefully, well, it remains to be seen. You know, I, I don't want to brag in advance, you know. So uh, so we'll see. But uh, I have the good feel about the set. And I think, it, you know, people will be happy. It'll be it'll be a good journey uh, from uh, between the uh, b- between the very late 90s and then, then uh, today. I saw one interview that you did, and you mentioned that him is in the past. The question was something about like a reunion, something along those lines. And he said, right. in the past, I'm I'm moving forward. Uh, when you guys decided to take a break, were you surprised by how much love and how much support the fans have for the band and have for yourself at that specific moment? Yes. Yes, we realized that it is quite shocking, to be honest with you. It's something because when you're in band, it's like a bubble and you have your own set of rules and it's your own little universe. And at times it's tough to, you can't see the forest for the trees. Uh, and you were positively surprised about the, the level of sort of enthusiasm and, and the intensity of, of emotions. But, uh, but then again, uh, you have to follow the music and you have to trust your instinct and you're not there as a band or as an artist. I think you have to first follow the muse, follow the inspiration, create what you create from the heart, hope that it, hope that it will resonate one day. But it's, it's still not, you're not thinking of the end user, the term they probably use these days. You know, you're not, you're not thinking about a, a person somewhere in, in another, another country trying to fulfill that person's wishes because that's not what we're here for. We're here for being who we are and doing it the best we can and be as unique and identifiable and, uh, and special as we can about it to when, when we're working and building our own world. And with that, I'm talking about uh, as a we, so I'm talking about as, as him, as the band, but uh, it's the same thing with the, with the solo stuff. It's, it's worthless to try to speculate what's gonna work and what doesn't work because that's a that's a wrong conversation. You're getting ahead of things. You have to you have to listen to yourself. You have to listen to the guitar, and you have to um, really follow the song and follow the melody and uh, and let it lead you wherever it takes you. Because that's I think or how all the special stuff has always happened in my life. At least all the musical stuff, you know, through through you know closing your eyes and, and stumbling in the dark. One last question for you. Uh, and, and that is about your voice and your career. Uh, you have such a unique voice, such a unique delivery, unique tone. Uh, there's there's no two VLAs out there. That's just face the facts. There's only you and we'll hope, hopefully we'll have you for a very long time for many, many, many generations. Uh, how old were you when you discovered the gift that you had, this natural gift that you have? And, and when you decided to be a musician, how was your parents' reaction to that? Well, originally, uh... Uh, I got into Kiss and Iron Maiden when I was what, seven, eight years old or whatever. At that time, my first album ever was Animalized by Kiss out of all records. You know, that was the, that was the that was the thing. But uh, um, uh, bass guitar was my first instrument. And uh, originally, when we started forming him, I played sort of the guitar parts with a six string bass. And I didn't really want to be the singer. We had we had a, quite, quite a few people in mind uh, in Helsinki. Uh, but it never panned out. And then at that time, when I, when I was singing, I sounded quite a lot like King Diamond. I did really high falsettos. And it was weird. I, I didn't know of my baritone voice at that time at all. And uh, and that was after my voice had broken. So it wasn't about that. Uh, the uh, uh, It took a long while. I'm st- I think these days I'm getting a bit more confident with my voice. But, um, but it's... It, it, it kind of happened. And then, it, then the baritone thing happened because I fell in love with Type 4 Negative with Sisters of Mercy. I wanted to sound like them. You know, I, I wanted to sort of figure that stuff out. Before that, I loved uh, Perry Farrell and, and, and uh, Mike Patton and, uh, and Ozzy. So that's the stuff I was, was very nasally and very high. And uh, I was working on that for a long time. But, uh, but yeah, as always, it takes a while for you to sort of like find out your identity. And it usually happens through 
playing cover tunes with the band. We had uh, Chris Isaac's Wicked Game, which we played quite a bit, and that oh, helped us out. Like incredible cover, best cover helped, of, that, uh, of that song ever done. Yeah, but I think. Thank you. I think well, it's a fantastic song. You can't really mess it up. But uh, I thought that with that song, we were able to sort of find the balance between the sentimentality and the melancholy. We've mentioned several times, and the sort of like hard hitting, the balls to the walls guitars and the hard rock or metal. And uh, and so it was same with singing. It took it took a lot of tries to to figure out uh, my range and what to do. And I, I I felt ashamed about my voice for I think the first five hymn albums or whatever. So I kept on drinking and smoking away. But uh, <laughs> To uh, to get, uh, get you know to get my confidence levels up, but um, but these days it's easier. Then I I made the wise decision of uh, quitting smoking a while ago, you know, a few years ago. So that helps a ton, and that keeps the voice in in, in quite a good shape. But uh, voice is a weird thing. It's it's a very sensitive thing. And then I've never taken any lessons. I've always thought that if it doesn't hurt, then you're doing the right thing. And uh, even if it hurts a bit, that's that's okay. That's when you're screaming your lungs out. But uh, but yeah, I. I I don't know what happened. My mom, she's always out of tune. She sings when she's drunk, which happens. <laughs> really heavy, but like, you know, oh, like once every five years or whatever. And my dad can't hold a tune at all. So uh, I'm not sure where it, where it all comes from. But uh, but yeah. I'm I'm happy to be able to do what I do. It's a uh, and yeah yeah. It's uh, I'm not sure if the voice is recognizable, but the but the weird Finnish accent for sure is. You know, I'm I'm always second to Klaus Minor from the Scorpions when it comes to cool, dodgy, weird European accents. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have a great delivery. Uh, the accent is beautiful. It's just part of your, <laughs> part of your aura. So uh, oh, it is. It is. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Vile, thank you very much for your time today. It was an absolute pleasure and honor to have you on our channel. We're huge fans of yours. Uh, cool. We've covered so much of of him on the channel, and it's been such a blast to be able to talk to you and talk about this debut record, Neon Noir. I'm keeping my fingers crossed for that Toronto, Canada date. If you need a drive to Thunder Bay, let me know. I'll be more than happy to be there. <laughs> I'll, I'll, yeah, I might just hold you up, up on that. Yeah, yeah. and uh, thank you for taking the time. And uh, I'm, indeed, hope to see you in Canada in, uh, next year. Some, you know, yeah, hopefully in the autumn time. I'm, I'm fingers crossed. Fingers and uh, yeah, and the, uh, yeah, the happiest of holidays to you and yours. And yeah, a great start for 2023. So have, so. A, have a great 2023. Yeah, likewise. Catch Take you care. later. Bye. All right. <laughs> Bye.